hope you will join me in welcoming um, seven amazing women to have a conversation that I think we've sort of been having pieces of all throughout uh, the conference, but we'd like to close out the conference by having a really productive conversation and walk away um, ever more unified as a community, ever more inclusive and diverse, uh, and ever more willing to, to do better, be better, speak up, say more, um, identify who we are and, and what we stand for. Um, and that's really what we hope this, these brilliant women can help pull together. So please join me in welcoming Feminista Jones. Ke Kelly Wickham. Nat Natalia Oberti Noguera. Natalia Oberti Noguera. You can actually come around that way. Okay. Never mind. Um, Cheryl Conti, who is our fine moderator. Grace Swang Lynch. Kristen Howerton. And Patrice Lee. Thank you. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. Uh, race, gender, and feminism online has been in the news. Uh, it's a topic on Blogger. It's a topic in mainstream culture. You only have to look at the ban bossy hashtag right, to uh, get a sense of how that's beginning to play out. So we wanted to invoke an interesting and stimulating conversation with some leaders on stage with me. I'm really excited to have these amazing ladies. So I'm going to kick it off with a question to the panel about your online persona and your voice. Do you consider that a form of activism or self-expression? Is there a difference? Did you intend to become an activist or was activism thrust upon you like when that spider bit Peter Parker? <laughs> Feminista, why don't you go first? Oh, okay. Um, I think I was born an activist uh, because I was born a black woman. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that my persona absolutely shines through in uh, my social media presence. I also think that um, I've been able to use my social media presence and persona for activism and to try to facilitate conversations that I think are moving a lot of us forward in, in, in different ways. Um, so I think, I don't think that anything was thrust on me. I think I embraced it and this is, I didn't anticipate this. I just wanted to talk about sex. But, <laughs> but I, I think that I, I've been able to, to grow into something and when I realized that I had a following and that people were listening, I decided to use my voice for something more. Kelly? I uh, don't think I went into this um, knowing that I was an activist. I think that it organically happened for me. And then when I realized the power of my voice, I really kind of started to use it and was trying to be responsible. I'm always trying to be responsible with it, but my activism was mostly in education. And then I realized that there were way more issues that were there that were crossing over. So I went ahead and just said, I'm just gonna take every single thing that's important to me and talk about it. And, I just have a big mouth. So Deb on the Rocks, how many of you heard her speak yesterday? Right? She mentioned that she was a fan of the call out culture. It was very tweetable. I tweet it, so I hope you do too. And as an LGBTQ Latina, I have a lot of issues. So you know, when I go to a tech startup event, it's like racist, homophobic sexist comment, you know, like it gets very draining. And I remember having gone to an event where Ruth Simmons spoke and she was, she's the first black president of an Ivy League university. And she's also the first female president of Brown University. And I heard her speak and she said, you know, for all of, uh, all of you who call out stuff and speak up, please continue to do so because there might be people in the room who don't realize that they have a right, that they have a voice. And that was a really, key turning point for me because I just thought that people were apathetic. I was like, I'm going to be the one calling out the elephant in the room again, you know, fine. And realizing that, yes, sure, there's some people who are apathetic, and yet that there are so many of us who might not realize that we have a voice just made me even much more of an activist to make sure that we create 
that space for us to own our voices. Thank you. I'd, want, I'd like to turn to this side of the panel for a different question, just riffing off of Natalia. Why don't some women speak out? Why don't, why don't some women feel that there are safe places or safe spaces? Are there safe spaces or do we need to create them? Grace? It's a risk. I really think that people are, you know, you hear about people who are getting attacked online, they're getting nasty comments, they're getting people hacking into accounts, impersonating them, that happened to me, um, you know, making cartoons and, you know, effigies of people. Uh, you, you heard about what happened with Anita Sarkeesian with the video games and people made a, a video game, like, you know, of people doing terrible things to her. So people like safety and, you know, especially for women, we know that there's kind of a fear of what you do online somehow may transfer into your real life. Someone may track you down, someone may track down your children. And we like to make sure that our personal lives are safe. It's a risk. Kristen, your blog is called Rage Against the Minivan. Uh, so uh, you created a safe space for yourself. How, do, what advice do you have for women in terms of being out there and making uh, a difference? Um, you know, I think we need to stop being scared of talking about difficult issues um, online. And I think, I think that our online stuff reflects what's happening in the world at large. And I think that um, people are really, I think a lot of people are scared of talking about race. I think, first of all, they're not acknowledging it to begin with, um, especially, you know, um, people who are white just think, like, that's an issue that I don't have to deal with and I don't really want to go there. So they don't want to talk about it in real life and they certainly don't want to talk about it online. So I think a part of um, moving this conversation forward is for everybody to get comfortable talking about difficult issues, sexism, racism. Patrice, uh, you straddle the lines and you're in a, you are a rare uh, black conservative. Mm -hmm. How is that for you? Are, have you found welcome online or have you experienced trolls? So I've had trolls, um, including one gentleman who uh, told me that I didn't understand my history and he couldn't understand why I held the, the thoughts that I did. And it's very funny because he assumes that I, my, my uh, historical background is in the United States. I was actually born overseas in a small British colony. So my family came to this country because of the opportunity that the United States affords. So I actually have a very unique perspective. And as a conservative black female, um, I get everything from, I didn't know you exist. Um, to, there are like five of you and you all are related, right? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's important for us to create spaces where even if you don't agree with me, um, at least listen to what I say before shutting me down and assuming that, you know, I'm just crazy or I'm misinformed about everything. For myself, I'm the moderator so I can just interject. <laughs> uh, for myself, some people uh, may know me as the co-founder with Veritunde Thurston of Jack and Jill Politics. Uh, which uh, was a top black political blog during the 2008 and 2012 elections. And when I wrote under a pseudonym, as did most black political bloggers in around 2006, 2008, and uh, it was frightening. I mean, definitely there was a reason we chose pseudonyms. Traditionally, outspoken black people have a tendency to get shot at. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, when I revealed you know, my identity to my mother and brother, they actually asked me to stop. Um, and I had to really think about whether or not it was, whether it was worth the risk, whether self-expression was worth the risk to myself, to my family, to my livelihood. And I decided uh, that it was. How do you all, have you been trolled? Have you been attacked online? <laughs> Feminist is laughing. <laughs> have you been attacked online as a woman self-expressing uh, on the internet? Uh, and what was that like for you? You can look up my name right now. Somebody's probably calling me something right now. <laughs> um, I, I do use the name Feminista Jones, and I, I use it because I do protect, uh, I try to protect uh, my identity. Um, unfortunately, I've had where people have found my name, my address, have tried to post it and say, let's get her. Um, the, a guy recently made a meme basically putting all of my information, so now I have a lot of trolls who are speaking to me in that name, making sure that it's out so that people know it. Um, I've tried to keep that separate because I do regularly have people saying I need to be lynched or gang raped or whatever, um, talking about how my son needs to be killed and things like that. I get that every day. Uh, so 
that the, the idea of trolling, right? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit beyond trolling. Yeah. It is abuse. It is abuse, and I talk about this, uh, particularly as a black woman. Um, as a woman, you're gonna get a lot of trolling, and you're gonna get a lot of abuse from people who are, they don't wanna hear what women have to say. Um, as a black woman, woman of color, but black woman, you're gonna get things like, you should be lynched, you ape. You, you know, you're gonna get the, you should be raped. You're gonna get the women stuff, you're gonna get the, the race stuff, and it's gonna be really harsh, and it's gonna be really severe, and it's gonna come from white people, it's gonna come from black people, it's gonna come from everyone. And it's constantly, constantly, like every day, because I'm talking about race, I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about sex, it's, it's all the time. And um, there are people who have made very serious threats to me, like, I'm gonna find you at your job, I'm gonna, don't walk home alone tonight, those kinds of things, just because I feel like speaking up for women and for black people. Kelly? I have not experienced the same level that, that she's experienced, and I, I watch a lot of what happens to her online, and um, I think mine comes more in the form of passive aggression, um, of people saying I'm upsetting, you know, some things if I want to talk about something that they don't feel like talking about, and so it comes in, in the form of, I don't know if you really have a platform. I'm not sure if what you're talking about is really a thing. Um, which, it's not a thing. <laughs> um, that's erasure, that's totally That's erasure. total erasure, and that's, that's just a way for, you know, for a, someone to try to shut that conversation down. Um, but I do not get the, the same vitriol I, I see, not just towards feminista, I see that towards a lot of women online and a lot of women of color online. Sure, well we saw with Adria Richards, who many of Absolutely. you may know, I mean, it can be a challenge when you are a woman inside a company, and a company, even if they support you, they may not want to deal with the blowback right. of a woman who is, you know, expressing herself or, or standing up for herself. Natalia, as an entrepreneur, does it make a difference in terms of your ability to be independent and be out there in, in a more outspoken way? Yeah, so my partner, she's 10 years older than me. She is a lawyer um, within a bank in Manhattan. And she's still, you know, like people talk about within the U.S., you know, like the East Coast and West Coast, they're okay. You know, no homophobia there. It's just like the Midwest. <laughs> like it's everywhere. And, um, you know, so she's not officially out at work. So, yes, she's 10 years older. And just to give you a sense on, an, uh, you know, just an uh, experience she had, her former boss, uh, who's 10 years older than she is, they were social, you know, they were at an event, they were socializing, and the boss goes to her and she says, well, you know what, Peter, he used to work for us, I think he's a homosexual. And I call, and then I call her like she's a turtle, because she was starting to like peek out, peek out, and of course after that, <laughs> she went back in, you know? And so one of the things that I pride myself in, I, you know, people talk about entrepreneurs and it's so hard, so hard to be an entrepreneur, et cetera. I will tell you one thing about being an entrepreneur. We are our own boss. We have our own agency. And then as much as maybe I don't have the monthly or bi-weekly paycheck, I don't have to worry about someone potentially firing me for who I am. And so since then, I have actually overcompensated in terms of being like out and proud and talking about it. And do you know what? I actually am much more, um, much more aware of being out at the, like what I do, Python Fellowship is an angel investing boot camp. So generally when I go to these sorts of finance events or startup events, I, I, I'm on a panel and I'm bookended by two straight white guys. So it's generally during those panels that I want to make sure that I'm speaking up more because we need to mainstream these conversations. And that's one of the reasons that I was excited to be here today because we're creating a space where we're talking about that hey, it's not just that we're women once, that we're pe people of color once, or that, for example, for me, we're LGBTQ at once. We're all of those at the same time. And one of the things that I remember, just you know, taking the trolling question and pivoting it a little bit, I was um, speaking, I was on a shark, you know, have you, have you watched Shark Tank? Yeah. yeah, so I was invited to be part of a Shark Tank um, by Cindy Gallup. Have you heard of her? She's the founder of Make, yes, let's. 
founder <laughs> of Make Love Not Porn, founder of If We Ran the World, and she was at Social Media Week for New York. She had a track called Changing the World Through Sex. And so I was one of three judges. The other two were these two straight white guys. And as I was uh, getting labbed up, one of the guys that I hadn't ever met he comes to me and he's like, I don't even know why I'm on this panel. And he like, he actually goes into my personal space and he's like, I guess it's because I like sex. And he did that. And in my own head, I was thinking, whoa, this would have been really awkward if I were straight. And I just said, like, without missing a beat, I said, well, like, and I'm here to represent the LGBT perspective. I have one visual for you. <laughs> On that note, uh, I, uh, I'm an entrepreneur myself, but part of my coming out as a blogger actually led to the ability to be uh, an entrepreneur. I launched a digital agency that works with nonprofits and foundations uh, online called Vision Strategy, and I'm also the co-founder of a startup called Attentively that works with big data, social listening, and marketing automation. I feel that my self-expression and activism actually helps those companies, but I realize also that, um, that I'm in a privileged, I have, I have privilege, right, that I can be that independent. Uh, so is it possible to experience privilege, um, whether it's being white or being affluent or educated or being an entrepreneur and your own boss and still be an effective uh, advocate, still create real talk around race and gender? Yeah, I what think so. What do you so. think, Grace? I think so. I mean, you don't have to be, talking about race is not just for people of color. Talking about feminism is not just for women. I think that you can. <laughs> You may not have the experience of feeling, you know, experiencing being discriminated against or having impacts of you because of your race or gender, but everybody has the ability to listen. Everybody has the ability to participate in conversations and to elevate those conversations. And you know, we all have our own, we all have our own circles of influence. And I think especially for people who don't fall into the traditional category of like, oh yeah, those issues impact them, um, you know, they may have access to other people and those other people can, you know, you can, you can amplify the messages that people of color or that women are sharing. And when you read an article, you read a blog and, you know, you can post it on your Facebook page, you can share it on Twitter and the people in your PTA organization, your coworkers, you know, people at high level jobs, they, they can read it too. And you know, I think a lot of that is, uh, pow the power of the internet is just that everybody has the power to influence their own circles of friends in a way that we didn't have before. Absolutely, I used to be a normal person, a middle manager, and I started my blog one day after work after just seeing one news story too many that I just could not take it anymore. Yeah. And I never expected that that blog, that WordPress, very, no, it was a blogger, it was a blog okay. blog. <laughs> I never expected that that would bring me on stage with such amazing women like you all. Kristen, how can people approach these tough topics. Obviously, anyone, anyone can amplify someone else's voice, anyone can find their voice, and everyone hopefully should, but how, but that, it's a challenge, right? Yeah. We've, we've talked about some of those challenges. How can uh, the folks in this room potentially address these tough topics or, or broach them? Yeah, I mean, I, th I really think, I mean, to echo what she was saying, I think step number one is listening, and step number two is listening, and step number three is listening. <laughs> Um, if, you know, if uh, particularly, so we should listen, should yes. we listen? <laughs> you okay. know, particularly if you're outside of a group and you're wanting to be an ally to a group, you've mm -hmm. got to listen, number one, and then number two, you've got to amplify, you know, and then maybe then you wait in, um, with your own voice, you know, but I, I do think a part of addressing privilege, um, my response to knowing that I have privilege is to say, how am I going to use that to make sure that people who are not in that seat are being heard. Um, and I think that that is a responsibility for all of us. I mean, what Feminista is saying when she's talking about the abuse that she gets on Twitter, that is not my experience. And I know why that's not my experience. 
Um, I know exactly why. And so when I hear that, I think, well, I need to step up here. Um, you know, and then we all do, you know, as a community to make sure that people are not being abused online while the rest of us are just sitting and doing nothing because we don't have to be engaged in these conversations. We, we should want to be. Yeah. Well, and right, this is a blog, her conference, where mostly women, I mean, certainly, you know, if one woman is attacked, and to a certain extent, we're all under attack. I mean, yeah. we, you know, the things that someone says about another woman that are demeaning or condescending or violent, ultimately, that's violence that could visit us. So, Patrice, I would ask you, I mean, how do you approach addressing the impact of race and gender in your digital presence? Is it different, you know, when you're talking with your friends versus your colleagues? Is it different, you know, on Twitter versus in front of, say, a thousand or so of your friends here at BlogHer? What, what is it like for you and how do you approach it? So I'd like to think that um, I take the blinders off and I'm not just the black girl in this in the group. Um, and I'd like to think that my colleagues and um, and my associates and the people that you know that I hang around don't just see me for the, for the out for my exterior. Um, and and I, when I'm online, that's kind of the way I try to look at it. It's not just I'm the voice for all black conservatives across the country. I, that's not my point. My point is that I'm, I'm just trying to be a voice for people who share the same philosophy that I do. And if you happen to look the same way or, or share some uh, cultural uh, similarities, similarities to me, then that's great. But you know, I, I think we need to move just a little bit beyond just associating ourselves based on the way we look um, and based on our, our heritage. We're all different and there's nothing wrong with celebrating our individuality. There's nothing wrong with celebrating our individuality. I would echo that. Uh, so one uh, last topic for, and I'll just toss it out to whomever on the panel would like to jump on it. And then I'd, I'd love to hear from the audience and get your questions. There are mics, uh, I think, on either side here up front. Are we holding mainstream media and pop culture accountable enough? And, and are there things that we could be doing in a different way, in a more advanced way? And maybe what does the future hold? As women are 30% more active than men on social media, 97, something like 97% of moms have smartphones, we actually over-index on at pretty much every internet platform you can name. How, how is that going to impact uh, pop culture going forward? Anyone? Well, I love TV, so period. That's it. You can live tweet that. Um, <laughs> and for example, when you think about so how change can be effected through TV, it's powerful. GLAD has some surveys that showcase that, um, you know, shows like Glee, Modern Family, et cetera, have really helped change the wave of tolerance in terms of the LGBTQ community because it's, it's coming to people's TVs, to their living rooms. They're realizing that we, we're people. You know, it's humanizing us. And I did want to give two shout outs. I'm, I'm outside the demographic that they're like, um, that they want us to be at. However, I still find that they're super powerful. How many of you watched The Fosters or Switched at Birth? Yeah, so ABC Family is actually doing some really interesting stuff with Switched at Birth. They have a Latina family, and guess what? We're not really that well represented on TV. And they also have um, a family, um, one of the characters is deaf. So there will be two to five minutes of complete silence sometimes on primetime TV because people are signing. And I'm just thinking of, yes, like, I'm thinking when we talk about intersectionality, you know, I do want to make sure that, you know, we are talking about as a cis woman, you know, like I am thinking about myself as an ally, you know, for transgender people. We mentioned in our call that, you know, there isn't anyone over 50 on this panel and being really aware of, okay, so how can we create that space for those who are not here? And Media Ponte, she has a saying, which is, if you're not, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring your own chair. So if some of uh, you know, the two, um, at least the two identities that I have mentioned, if, if that's you, please you know, make sure to ask us a question to get involved into the conversation because in addition to listening, it's also opening the door for us to be here. 
Right, or trans uh, yeah. men and women on Eurovision, RuPaul's Drag Race. I think that's a new frontier in pop culture. Anyone else in terms yeah. of, yeah? I don't think that we do a good job of representing any damn thing. Um, I mean, that's just, I'm just going to be honest. I think we can use our social media presence, we can use our blogs, we can use our writing to do more of that direct calling out. For example, for three months straight, every single weekend, I tweeted at HuffPost Parents, why do you only feature funny white parents? Mm -hmm. If you would check the HuffPost Parents Roundup every single weekend, it was nothing mm -hmm. but funny white parents, mm -hmm. as if parents of color did not exist. After two and a half months, I got a response that said, well, can you direct me to some parents of color? I should not uh, have to direct you to parents of color. Yeah, it's called the internet. You don't do their work. are on the Black same Twitter. internet that yeah. I am on. You can go and find them. <laughs> Torrid, we, I, I tweet Torrid all the time. Torrid makes a lot of money from black big women, and yet they refuse to use models that are darker than paper bags. I just, the other day, they had, we had a picture of a blonde, straight-haired white woman modeling a picture of a black woman silhouette with nappy hair. Why did that happen? It should not happen. And what's happening with these kinds of things is that they continue to happen because we're afraid to speak up and say, this isn't right. And you don't have to be black, you don't have to be gay, you don't have to be transgender, you don't have to be poor to know when something is not right. And I think what I want to impart, like, because I, I think, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be very honest. I think that this conversation is, it's, this is the the scratch. It's like a little scratch off. We're barely getting to where we need to get with this. What I want to leave with you all is that you, each of you has a space online, pretty much. That's why you're here. You have the space. You have a voice. You need to use it because there are people that are relying on you to make some kind of a difference. You may be all about the brands, you may be all about your kids and things like that, but your kids, you, you talking to your kids about these things is gonna make a difference in the future. It's, we're not colorblind. I don't want you to not see the fact that I have brown skin. I want you to see this, and I want you to love it for what it is, <laughs> right? So that's what I think, and I think, I think that we all, every single one of us, has a responsibility, as you said, to amplify voices. We don't have to speak for anyone. I don't speak for trans people, I don't speak for natives, I don't speak for anybody, but I will retweet and I will share their articles and I will do what I want because I have 28,000 followers who could probably benefit from that. And I think that that's what we can do, right? Right, and I think there are two, there are two ways, right, right, to be supportive. You can call out something that is wrong, that's negative, or you can support something, mm -hmm. right? Scandal yeah. wouldn't have become the huge show that it is without the support on Twitter of its online audience. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's lots of different ways uh, to be supportive, to take a stand, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in that uh, vein, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Who would like to ask a question? Yeah, right there. Oh, yes, yes over there. Yes, <laughs> go. Can they bring up the lights? Uh, yeah, can we bring up the lights a little I'm bit so we can see? I'm Stacey Morrison. I'm the editor-in-chief of BlogHer. I'm a professional loudmouth. And I have considered myself an activist and advocate since I started working in publishing when I was 21 years old. And I want to ask you the question I have been dying to ask since we scheduled this. I was mortified and put to shame by Kelly Wickham's beautiful post, Lean In, where she said, where are you, my sisters, in the Trayvon Martin case, after the verdict came out. And I had my mind blown because it actually hadn't occurred to me to write something about it because I felt unsafe doing it. And that's crazy. Um, and it's because we ended up in this funny place, like privilege, yes, I know I'm white, I'm privileged, I'm upper middle class, I got so much going for me, but I don't wanna offend people that I love and I'm constantly trying to find ways to include diversity. I mean, the reason I'm at Blogger is look at this room, think about the things we've been talking about. Um, and I think it feels really scary. I mean, are there women in the room who are afraid to talk about these things? And it's sort of silly to ask you for advice, but I'm never gonna get a better chance. So Trayvon Martin, I understand. I see my missed opportunity there. I don't give myself a pass, but I feel like so much of it is minutia and overlay and intersectionality and it's this and it's that. And 
Um, I just want to do better and I want to know how. Um, and I feel like a lot of it is, I mean, I go to the school of Feminista Jones. Having this woman in my life has changed my life. All of you should follow her. She is a true warrior, and she's funny as hell. Absolutely. I do. I want to just cut you off so that we oh, right. can yeah. have the panelists. Anyway, so I asked my uh, question. So. Ask <laughs> Thank you, honey. Kelly, uh, I think it sounded like that was directed in part to you. I, I have heard that question over and over and over since I wrote that particular piece. And that's not a bad thing, Stacey. Don't make that face. Um, because I think what, that, what I was saying was, really, I was just a asking us to all be humans. And I was asking us to all say, we, we sit in this room and we talk about womanhood and empowerment and being a feminist and being strong, but at, at what point did we draw a line and say, but I'm not gonna talk about that, when it fell under that same umbrella? At what point did we delineate that we're gonna discuss this, but we're not gonna discuss that? Which is why I asked that question at the end. Do you not know Sabrina Martin? Do you, do you not have anything in common with that woman, that mother? Hell yes, you do. And that was my question. And I was really, really struck by, by sometimes a lack of response. And I didn't realize I was going to make so many people speechless when it came to that. Um, but I'll tell you what, I am as much an ally for different things. And I think, so, you know, you just mentioned it. There's plenty of things online that I'm just shutting up and listening to because I, that's not my experience, but I will retweet it. I will share out a story. I will say, this is an important thing. And I think that that's where we start. Yeah, I, I, I think that's you, it. Oh, go ahead. Feminism, feminism is a practice. Being an ally is a practice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whenever someone gets called out, you know, I hear, I hear it so often, but he's a good guy. I'm like, well, not that time. Mm -hmm. You know, so each time, that's why I like to call it a practice because it's, each day, you know, like who cares what you did yesterday? What are you doing today? And I'll give you two examples. I, um, I spoke at this conference, it was a women's conference, and the event organizer was sharing with me, we achieved gender parity. 50% women speakers, 50% men speakers. And it was like, yeah, they're all white. You know, and it's those sorts of conversations that we have to have. I will, I will call out, you know, blog her because this is, this is what we need to push back. I know some people who left yesterday and ha if, by leaving yesterday, they would not have known of so many women of color who spoke today during the 10 by 10, during the keynotes, you know. Yes, be, and also having an intersectional perspective is about having conflicting takes on issues. Yesterday, there were three LGBTQ people on stage. That hasn't really ever happened to me at a conference where there isn't LGBTQ on the title. I was like, this is phenomenal, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the same time, I believe yesterday all the 10 by 10s were, and the lunch keynote, were white people, you know? and. You and I, because we've been here for the whole two days or three days, we know that there were so many amazing people and women of color who spoke today. If you left yesterday, you would not have realized that. And so it's about us continuing to support each other and continuing to call each other out. And that's why I started this conversation today by shouting out Deb on the Rocks, because it is about being a fan of the call out culture. And it is about, this is a work in progress that like now I'm, you know, obviously quoting Kerry Washington. And, um, and it is about us being together and creating that safe space for us to call ourselves out. Because there's some people who are like, and this is where I will also give you the opportunity to say, some people, it's just, just not worth it. You know, when we're talking about trolls, it's just not worth it for you to use all that energy for certain people. And there's some people that hopefully we can make, we can make a difference for. We can educate. And, and I would say, if you're able to approach the topic with a sense of humility and being willing to say, okay, maybe I got it wrong, but now that I've heard, I understand. And, You'd be surprised on the internet that people will accept that. They'll embrace you if you're willing. It's actually if you keep pushing back, if even as you hear from others, hey, that's not my experience, or you might not have that quite right, that's when you really get in trouble. It's, it's not if you make a mistake or you, you 
you know, show that maybe you, you don't understand fully someone else's experience. So coming at it with some humility. Why don't we go here to the green? Hi, my name is Anne Marie and I write it do not faint. Um, you won't. <laughs> I want to bring income inequality into this conversation um, sure. because the Me only too. time I have experienced abuse on my blog, which has my photo in the about page, um, I'm very white in case you can't see me. The only time I have experienced the kind of abuse that, that I've heard from the women of color is when I wrote about the difference in my experience using WIC versus SNAP, <laughs> food stamps. I was trying to be informational and that, that comment section is full of men raging at me and other men responding to them. And I tweeted a few minutes ago a post from someone saying, why doesn't your husband defend your honor? Um, so that I just want, I know you don't have time to cover everything. So I'm just adding that because it seems to add a layer of intensity to and a, a drive to the trolls um, that I don't participate, but I see my commenters come stand up for me. And it's just a really intense thing to be this educated white woman using food stamps and just trying to help other people understand how it works because it's confusing. Can, and then I, you get that. Can yeah. I say that? Uh, yeah. I, I'll put it out there. I make over $100,000 a year and people still call me a ghetto hood rat. I have white men that say, oh, you're just one of those Obama people trying to get money, free money to feed your kids. Oh, why don't you go take these food stamps and go feed your kids? The income issue, unfortunately, in this country is almost inextricably linked with race, right? And, and we have those, those issues. Um, a really great, um, if you don't know about talk poverty, please check out talk poverty because it's a poor white woman, a woman who, white woman who grew up poor who really takes on these issues. Poor and as she, folk is yes, similar. The sister, right? Yes. And um, <laughs> that's funny that you got that stuff because that the assumption for women of color, especially black women, is that you are broke, you don't have a man, you have, you're a single mom, you're living off of the government, and you're doing all these things. And when you respond, I make more money than you, <laughs> then you become every kind of haughty bitch that they've ever uppity. heard of, every uppity <laughs> bitch. <laughs> then you, you know, you we took some, you took somebody's spot in college. I don't give, a, I don't care that you went there. You probably took somebody's spot in college. You know, we, we deal with that stuff as well. And that the income issue, this idea that people are, you as a woman are living off of the government, or whatever. That's only because white men can't get jobs. So as white men now can't get jobs, the the vitriol towards poor people. It doesn't matter what you are, particularly. If you were a woman, they really hate your ass now because well, femin they can't uh, even get work. Yeah, feminists, I want to turn Sorry. to Patrice. Do you want to uh, weigh in here? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're good. You're good. I just want to get... Yeah. I, I think there, it's an interesting comment about income. And I think a lot of, uh, from the conservative perspective, a lot of conservatives want to move it beyond race to income. And you're right. They actually are very closely linked. Um, I think it's uh, it's... It's silly that people assume that if you're black and female that you're just poor and that you're ghetto trash. Um, but if you then have a conservative perspective and all of a sudden you're enlightened, I, I think generally we need to realize, um, especially, and, and I, can't, I can't assume that all of the comments that you're receiving on, this, um, on your blog were from conservative men, but I, I do think that there is a strain of men who feel like, well, why am I not getting ahead and others are? And I think that um, that gets to some of the issues around um, affirmative action and whether or not uh, because some have been helped along, all of a sudden others have been left behind. And you know, that's, that's a whole other ball of, of, of wax that I don't, know, I don't know if we want to open up right now, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's silly. Kristen, it is, as our, a systemic as our, problem, yeah. and, and honestly, we're not going to get anywhere unless we look for systemic solutions. Yeah. And what, a lot of what we're trying to do is put a Band-Aid on a broken arm, yeah. or what we're trying to do is we're saying, there's a reason for this, and I can pinpoint it, and it all boils down to black women taking all of the welfare. Mm -hmm. And I, I live in the capital of Illinois, and I can tell you that the number one person on welfare in Illinois is the elderly white woman. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, more, more white people are, are accepting help from the government than any other race. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. I do, why don't we take one more question here, and then we'll close it down. 
Hi, I am Dresden. Um, I, Can you I speak run, into the mic? Yes, I am Dresden. I also am a white woman that used to be on welfare. Dresden. Hi. Um, <laughs> so, just sidebar. Um, so I have a question. I have, I'm white and I have a white son. He's five. I am an enthusiastic white friend. I have black friends. I like to talk to my black friends about race a lot. Um, so I want to know at what point do I need to simmer down? I am good at listening. But I also really want to talk about it a lot because I want to make sure I don't F up raising a white boy in America. I don't want him to be a bad white boy in America. I don't, I'm from no, Alabama. I don't, want him, I don't want to repeat things. No, so that's I want great. to keep talking about it. So what, what's the best thing? And I will listen now. I love it. Uh, Kristen, as our token white person <laughs> on the panel, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> you have any advice? Um, you know, one of the things, I, I gave a talk at a, at a um, festival a couple weeks ago on white privilege, and I talked about listening. And then um, apparently, immediately after my talk, a bunch of the white folks in the audience approached people of color in the audience to have the race discussion. <laughs> and so I do think it is important to recognize that, like, our black friends are not here to educate us. Um, Thank you. If, if you have a black friend that is, or you know, Asian, Asian friend, Asian. Latina friend, um, who's willing to talk with you about these things, that's awesome, but that should not be a given, and that should be really appreciated, and it should always be like asking like, do you have the time and bandwidth to have this conversation with me right now? There are so many ways to learn about these issues beyond barraging our friends of color in our conversations and making them have the race conversation at, over coffee when, you know, because maybe they don't feel like it. And so I, I do feel like a, as white people trying to raise good citizens, we need to figure out the resources to not be a burden on our, or, you know, put that burden on our friends of color. I mean, and the great thing is we're all internet savvy and there's so many places online and ways to, you know, to educate ourselves online instead of putting our friends in these awkward conversations. I think dialogue is really important, yeah. though. I think as someone who is often the black friend, um, and there's a great book by Bertunde, uh, my friend, called How to Be Black. So good. Yeah, which yeah. Talks, it ha talks in great detail about the, being the black friend and the black coworker. But, I mean, Grace, do you want to have the last word? I know Hapa Mama uh, yeah. talks about some of these issues as well. I do, as well. I do, because I... Um, you know, I, I sometimes find myself being the token Asian friend. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there's a balance, you know, not every person of color is, people have different levels of interest in talking about race. And some people really, you know, I don't know, somehow it bubbles up in my life and everything. I, I you know, I notice things and I'm, I'm, you know, I feel personally pretty comfortable talking about race. But I also know that sometimes, even for a person who wants to talk about race, it gets to be a, a drain on you emotionally. And, you know, I've talked about it with other people and, you know, sometimes you feel like, okay, you know, I just need to pull back and I, I, I have a, you know, link to a website where there's some articles, you know, here's my blog, here's my friend's blog, here's another blog and you can read these and, you know, and we can talk about it later after you, you know, check out some of these links, you know, that might be a way to, to approach it. I mean, you know, there, there, I wouldn't ask people things that you can find out in popular culture already. I mean, if you have a specific question, what do you think about this particular issue? Or, you know, I have a question about like this word, is this terminology, you know, how do you, how do you feel about this? You know, I think that, you know, I, I don't like being put on the spot to be, well, you know, tell me all about your culture. Tell me all about what it's like to be, you know, an Asian person. You know, do you know Tai Chi? Do you, you know, I, I you know, that, that, that's a little awkward. Do you awkward. make kimchi in your backyard? Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I would say, I mean, just, you know, having the final word, we've got to close up. Oh, yeah. I did have a quick okay. question, and it's for the audience. I noticed that only white people seem to be in line to ask a question. And so whenever I'm at an event, and there generally are women and men, there were? Okay, I didn't, uh, well then the, the majority of the questions that I noticed were from white people. Then let me change it to that. And so the question is, and I'm at Nakis Nakis on Twitter, is why? You know, so feel free to just, let's continue the conversation, because a lot of times we have a panel, and then, great, so much energy, and then it's as if nothing happened the next day. And 
kind of, it, you know, like, I, I just invite you to step up to the plate and, you know, have, have your voice heard, because sometimes if, if we are not the ones stepping up next to the mic, then when, when will we be heard? Right, and, and any, any of us can, any of you can tweet at any of us. If you want to put the, um, the card with all of our names and Twitter handles up, uh, AV folks in the back, feel free to continue the conversation with us online, with each other on the hashtag. I hope that you write a blog post. I hope that you uh, send out a tweet or retweet an article that you think is really important. Uh, every one of us can make a difference. Every one of us can have a voice, especially if we have that dialogue with respect with humility, and with honesty. So I want to thank our amazing panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll stick